Main, what's up, man? And what's up, people? Everybody, um, we are here for episode two of our podcast. I'm Cameron Gunnels, and I'm with my guest. I'm Main Williams, financial advisor from Northwestern Mutual. That's right. And Main actually made the trip up from what Carolina? Yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. As a matter of fact. Yep, to come join us and be a guest. So appreciate you coming. Always, bro. Um, for those who don't know, this is my guy. Like we go all the way back to high school, played <laughs> against each other. He played at Coleraine. I played at Mason. Yep, yep. Um, and then ended up teammates at Ohio University, both DBs. So um, we actually really didn't go over our notes, so we might end up just talking about football the whole time. <laughs> but if we don't, either way, we got a few talking points here. So if we look at our phones, that's what we're doing. But um, anyway, tell me about what you do. Tell the people about what you do. Let's, let's start with that, and then let's roll into real estate, investment, stocks, whatever you want to talk about. Yeah, so a little bit more about what I do. Uh, I run a wealth management practice with Northwestern Mutual. Part of what we do is financial planning. I always try to relate things back to sports. So essentially what we do, we're the quarterbacks of everybody's financial plan, okay. right? Because, you know, we're going to facilitate different ideas. We're going to point people in the right direction the same way a quarterback would do, right? He's going to tell his receivers which route to run. He's going to tell his running backs, you know, what to do as far as pass protection, things of that nature. Yeah. And we kind of do the same thing from an overall planning standpoint, making sure people are taking advantage of all the things that they need to in order to truly build wealth over time. Mm -hmm. So long-term play. We're talking oh, about long-term yeah, play. Oh, yeah, man. This is a long-term play. I always tell my clients that, you know, not only do I want to work with you, mm -hmm. but I want to work with your kids one day. I want to work with your grandchildren, right? So this is a multi-generational deal because when we're talking about overall wealth building, right, it's a multi-generational thing, right? It doesn't just stop with us. You know, we have to then pass that wealth on as strategically as possible to our families, to our children, grandchildren, Lord willing, we have them someday. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's how that goes. And it's not just about, like, I feel like it goes both ways, though. I feel like we want to work with, with families, but also families should want to work with a team, right? So you want a, you know, a financial advisor you that works with your whole family. You want a realtor that works with your whole family. You want an attorney that works with your whole family. So you got to put together your team and then work with that team throughout everyone's uh duration our careers or lives right so exactly. tell me more so what else so what what is your what does your day to day look like so my day to day typically I'm meeting with folks from around 8 to 5 okay i get to the office around 7 i get my workout in in the morning uh around 5 a.m. Okay. you know before i get into the office um in the office again you know meet with folks from 8 to 5 um, you know, once I wrap up, I got back end stuff that I got to wrap up and send off. So you're working and, and then notes. Yeah, yeah. After yeah, the work. Yep, yep, yep. yep. I know so, how feeling. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm grinding. Um, you know, putting in twelve hour days. Mm -hmm. You know, Monday through Friday. Also getting to the office on, you know, Saturdays as well, and get some things done. So that's what a typical day looks like for me. So all the people you talk to, all the meetings you go to, what would you say is one of the most common things financially that comes up in the people you meet with? I would say the most common thing is... The most common conversations you're having. Yeah, um, definitely around budgeting, I would say. Uh, people find a hard time with budgeting, you know, because when we think about, you know, overall budgeting, figuring out where our money should go, typically, you know, 60% of Americans, you know, they're living paycheck to paycheck. That's a common pain point amongst the people that I'm sitting down with, right? Because no matter how much money you make, right, it's really all about how much you keep. Yeah, so, no, for real. Yeah. yeah. So budgeting plays a key factor in all of that. And what we've been able to do is, you know, truly be strategic, making sure they have a sound plan in place, not only to, you know, save money and invest, but you want to enjoy your money at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I always tell my clients, I'm like, hey, even though I'm a financial advisor, like, I don't want you living off of ramen noodles and eating peanut butter jelly sandwiches, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> we already did that. We yeah, already, that's yeah, in the past. Like, we already it's, been there. Yeah. It's, it's bigger <laughs> things to life than, uh, you know, just saving money. But I want to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to, making sure you're taking care of your business so at the same time you can go enjoy life as well. So I would say budgeting is a key thing. Okay. And so budgeting is a key thing with the current climate of, like, prices are high. There's so much going on in the yeah. world today, politically, economically. Yeah. Talk to me about how you can correlate that to the conversations that you're having with your, your people in every day, like the current environment compared to what the everyday person is going to when they meet with you for the first time. Yeah, and it's funny because, uh, <laughs> like, you know, obviously nowadays we got Instagram, we got TikTok, we got... Everybody look rich. A, yeah, every <laughs> everybody look rich, everybody taking trips, everybody mm -hmm. living their best life and yeah. whatnot, right? But also everybody's talking about, you know, financial advice on TikTok, on Instagram. 
So really what we've been able to do is truly educate, right? Educate our clients about, hey, you know, what are you doing? What, what are your benefits look like at work? Mm-hmm. Right? Are you taking advantage of everything that's available to you? Mm-hmm. Right? Do you have proper insurance coverage in place, whether that be disability insurance, life insurance, right? Do you have those things taken care of? And also, are you taking advantage of your 401k through mm-hmm. work? Right? So we want to make sure we keep the main thing the main thing. We don't really want to dive too deep into what everybody's talking about on social media, what they're talking about on CNBC, you know, Bloomberg, things of that nature. Like, you know, it's great. Like, you know, that's my job to yeah. really understand those things and be able to articulate them and, re- and relay them to my clients. But at the end of the day, you know, we have a plan and we want to stick to that plan. And, you know, how we can stick to that plan is making sure our money has a job and we're dedicating it to the areas that it needs to go. So it's less about, you know, focusing on what's going on in the media, mm-hmm. but more so about just sticking to our plan that we set out for. For the person. Exactly. Okay. That's good. So you, you're doing a lot of uh, putting out fires then when you're calling, when, when you're in meetings, people, oh, this is going on. That's because that's what I deal with a lot. So I yeah. deal with a lot of, as a, as a realtor and like an investment coach, a lot of what I hear is a lot of fear, a lot of panic from people who want to invest, yeah. but they're concerned about all the outside <laughs> things that are going on. Whether that be inflation, whether that be the cost of housing, interest rates, it could be so many different things. Um, so I guess for those people in in your seat, how do you communicate to them to let their plan continue to take motion and not allow the outside factors to influence their decision? But and if you do, do it in, intelligently, like exactly. like know how to understand those outside factors. Exactly. How do you have that conversation? And that's uh, that's a key point that you bring up regarding inflation. Um, so when we talk about inflation, you know, when we talk about financial planning, right, um, we want to make sure we have proper mechanisms in place first in order to invest, right? So typically with my clients, you know, want to make sure you got proper savings built, right? Typically you hear three to six months from other people out there, Mm -hmm. expenses, right? But, you know, I tell my clients like, Hey, whatever you feel comfortable with saving, right? If it's 15 grand, 20 grand, whatever your amount is that you need on hand to be prepared for emergencies, by all means, we save that amount, and then we can kind of shift gears. I'm gonna stop you right there, yep. Because I'm, I'm I'm gonna go through. So, cause I'm, I'm you said before you start think start thinking about investing and whatever it is, you want to make sure you have the proper things in place. Mm-hmm. The first thing you said was savings. Yes. And then you said whatever that amount is. Some people say three to six months. Others say you say whatever your safety net is. Absolutely. Should that be in your opinion? Again, your opinion. Should that be in the form of cash, or should that be in the form of some sort of fund? Should that be like it? Just starting out for someone who's mm-hmm. where are you taking that, and that's great. Uh, because right now, due to a high inflation, you know, or a high interest rate environment, mm-hmm. you know, now we have things such as high yield savings accounts, mm-hmm. money market accounts, those are looking a lot more attractive. Okay, so that's typically where I tell my clients to go because those money market accounts are paying out around four mm-hmm. percent on an annual basis, whereas your normal bank, where whoever you bank with is, you know, say it's fifth third or U.S. bank or whatever. They're gonna pay you 0.01% in interest. That's yeah, that's right. less than what I was gonna say. I was gonna say like one, but yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So those money market accounts and those high yield savings accounts, those are gonna be attractive for setting aside that emergency savings. Okay. And that's typically where I tell my clients to go. Okay. So that's the first one, savings. Yes. All right. The second one. Uh, disability insurance. Okay. That's extremely key, and a lot of people drop the ball on this because you know we're young. You know, we feel like we're gonna live forever, right? We feel like we're invincible, mm-hmm. right? And by all means, you know, we 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 should think that way, but we need to have a sound plan in place for when things go wrong, right. right? Such as getting hurt, getting sick, things of that nature, right? And that's where disability insurance comes into play. Because, okay. you know, if you happen to get hurt, right, and you couldn't work no more, what are you going to do, right? And typically what we see, employers, they're going to cover a percentage of your income, right? If you ever were to get hurt, ever were to get sick, that's why I tell people to pay attention to the benefits that are offered to them at work, that way they can be mindful of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, And essentially what we've been able to do is make sure they have 100% of their income coming in. That way if, you know, they do get hurt, they do get sick, they come across a challenge, they have enough money coming in to be able to continue to fund their lifestyle, but also to continue to save and invest. And typically that disability insurance, that typically have a term? Yeah. Like say, for example, I have a a W-2 job, a corporate job, mm -hmm. and I get hurt. How long do I continue to make, or does that vary from company to company, or is it like how does that work? Yeah, so uh, that's, that's a rabbit hole a little bit, but yeah. just real quick. Generally, what you'll find, uh, most companies they're going to offer you disability insurance and they're going to pay this for you, okay. right? And you know, say you never work again, mm-hmm. right? 
some companies they'll pay that disability uh to you until you turn sixty seven years old. Oh wow. Right. So okay. it's gonna it's gonna last for a while. Okay. Right. It's not, you know, uh five years or ten years or anything mm-hmm. like that. It'll last for a while. But what we found is they're gonna cover roughly sixty percent of your salary. But what they don't tell you is you're gonna be taxed on that money. Mm. The same way you pay taxes now while you're young, while you're healthy, mm-hmm. right, and you're still working. Uncle Sam, he gonna want this money even if you're not working, mm-hmm. right? So uh, that sixty percent that they're covering can very well turn into fifty, if not forty percent. That's why we have to figure out where the other fifty to sixty percent is coming from. from. Yep, and we're able to do that through having supplemental disability insurance in place. Okay, good stuff. Okay, so those are the t- so so far we're at two. Mm-hmm. We're at cash. Have have you know have your safety. Yep. Have your your disability insurance. Mm-hmm. What other institutions or things you need to be, have in place before you're ready to start, you know, or before you can safely invest? I would say life insurance is key as well. Okay. And that goes without saying, right, especially when we're talking about folks in the black community, mm-hmm. right, we typically have to post GoFundMes and things of that nature mm-hmm. for when somebody passes yeah. away. Mm-hmm. And that's not a good way to go about it, right? We should have proper systems in place. That way, you know, somebody does pass away. You know, we can put them away safely without having to post a GoFundMe, mm-hmm. and then we can pass some wealth on to their beneficiaries, to typically to their children, things of that nature to set them up for, you know, whether it be college, getting college paid for for them if the parents pass away too soon, uh, wiping away all debt, getting the house paid off, right, if somebody passes away too soon. So that's really what that looks like, and that's what we've been able to do from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. So it will be life insurance, and then the last thing. You know, as far as, you know, some defensive items to take care of is, uh, you know, paying down debt strategically, right? Wiping away all bad debt off the balance sheet, you know, such as credit cards, uh, such as, you know, other loans out there that are high interest bearing. Mm -hmm. We want to wipe those down and, you know, replace those off the balance sheet before we get into investing. Okay. Another thing that we can talk about in another... This might be like like episode like six seven, yeah, for sure, but it just for made sure. me think about it. Yeah. Is that life insurance is also a good move because that can also be uh, investment driver, Ooh. right? Mm. Um, so we'll talk about this another time. But there are ways to strategically use life insurance to help you get and attain your investment goals way quicker, and that that's what the the guys who are really killing it are doing. So we'll, we'll double back to that another time. Um, okay, so cash. Disability insurance, life insurance, and then strategically paying off debt. Yep. Now, for the people who want that, that we only said four items, mm-hmm. but when you add those up, that's that could be up to a hundred thousand dollars that you got to pay out before you're ready to actually start investing, right? So, oh, for the people yeah, who want to yeah. get involved in investing early, mm-hmm. can you see why people are kind of scared to do it, or, or why people why it seems like such a far off goal? Because to me, like like me, I'm somebody I started investing early, so did you. Yeah. That sounds like a very like far off unattainable thing Mm -hmm. you know yeah but cam you gotta think because you know when we started investing like we came out of school Mm -hmm. right we didn't have credit card debt right like Mm -hmm. my mom would have killed me if i came home with some credit card debt that's true i didn't think about that no you're right so we 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 sidestepped that we were fortunate enough to do so but we we sidestepped that um and also to the point you know we were young right our expenses were low right we Mm -hmm. we stayed at home with our folks for a, a good bit of time yeah Right, so we had a chance to essentially build ourselves up and put ourselves into a position to invest. And we were able to take on that risk while we were young mm-hmm. and while we were keeping our expenses at a minimum. Now, you know, life has changed. You know, you're an investor. Mm-hmm. You have responsibilities. You know, I am as well. And, mm-hmm. you know, life looks a little bit different now being 26, 27 years old mm-hmm. compared to what it was when we were 21, 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, things are a little bit different now. And this is the importance of having a team. <laughs> because I'm the type, I'm the type, I will, all those things that he said, do I have yeah. some of them in place, but some of them I don't. Yeah. But I'm the type, I will 100% take my cash and I'll go invest my cash yeah. before I pay off something. Because I, I personally feel confident that I can make more with my money on hand than I'm spending an interest on that loan or, or whatever debt I have. Um, but that's why it's my dog, right? Because he balances me out. Sure. So that's the importance of having a full scale team of both. Um, anything else you want to say on that topic? Nah, man, I'll say a team is uh, extremely important to have around you, right? And I always break, like, I bring things back to playing football. Like, I'm a football guy at heart. So, like, you know, you look at Bill Belichick, what he's doing with the Patriots when he had Tom Brady and things of that nature, right? You know, Bill Belichick, he was putting his guys in place, in position to 
you know, be successful, right? You need to have a proper team around you that allow you to do the same. And, you know, that's what we've been able to do in our practice. You know, not only we've been able to help our clients build wealth, but also been able to help them protect the things that are most important to them, right? Yeah. Such as their income, such as their family. Their time. And their time, yes. So yeah. uh, that's what we've been able to do. Cool. Yep. All right. So whenever you get there, whether, you know, you start early, whether you start before you've accomplished those things or after as you should, yep. um, what would you say, w- once you're at that point where it, it, it would be smart to you, why is it important not to wait? It is extremely important not to wait from the standpoint that compound interest, mm-hmm. right? It's our best friend. You know, Warren Buffett calls it the eighth wonder of the world, right? So mm-hmm. compound interest is uh, extremely crucial to your overall uh, progression and becoming financially free, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, uh, we actually did the numbers. In order to achieve a million dollars by the time you turn 65, if you start at 25, then it would take you $381 a month to invest, Right, accounting for a seven percent inflate or uh, interest rate. Okay. Right, you know it'll take you three hundred eighty-one dollars a month, but if you delay that by ten years, now it takes you eight hundred and twenty dollars a month to uh, accumulate a million dollars by the time you turn sixty-five. So that's kind of how compound interest works, and that's why you want to be on the better side of compound interest and not on you know uh, the downside. You know, with credit card debt, because the same thing goes with credit card debt as well. Mm-hmm. Right, you know, if you have you know. Uh, a credit card where it's 20% interest, mm-hmm. right? And um, you're not paying that down over time. Compound interest is not working in your favor. But if you start investing, right, it does, you know, start to work into your favor. Mm-hmm. And what I have here, I'm looking at some of the talking points. We also talked about um, outside of thinking big picture, what a lot of people do is they'll try to time the market. And so by trying to time the market, that will slow down when they get into the market. And so now, I mean, it might not have waited 10 years, but you waited two and a half years waiting for a downturn in the market. And so the dollar cost averaging in, whether that be in whatever your investment vehicle is. Um, so, yeah, just some more stuff that we were talking about offline. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and if I had a crystal ball and if I knew what the market was going to do each and every day, by all means, I would share that with my clients. I share that with you, bro. I love you. Yeah. But I don't have that crystal ball. Mm-hmm. So that's why we need to have proper systems in place so we can set money aside, you know, as early and as often as possible, right? So that'll definitely work into our favor. All right. So talk to me about some of your favorite investment vehicles. Yeah. So as far as investment vehicles, um, and we can get into the weeds on this a little bit, but just to keep it simple, uh, when I'm sitting down with folks, right, typically order operations, take advantage of the match with your 401k. Mm-hmm. Right. Take advantage of that. That's free money. Don't leave that, you know, on the table. You want to take advantage of that. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, you know, now we start getting into things, you know, we start getting into your investments growing tax efficiently over time. Mm-hmm. You know, we start getting into the conversation about Roth IRAs. Uh, we start looking into non-qualified brokerage accounts. Right. We start taking advantage of those things. OK. What's a non-qualified brokerage account? So that's like a Robinhood account. Right. You okay. know, you go open that up, you know, back mm-hmm. when, you know, stocks yeah. were going crazy yeah. back in 2020 and 2021. Non-qu- you call it, called it non-qualified. Mm-hmm. What makes it non-qualified? So it's non-qualified because it's not a retirement account. Okay. Right. Retirement accounts such as a 401k, traditional IRA, those are qualified investments. Mm-hmm. But uh, a, a brokerage account is not. Right. So when you have a brokerage account and you have investments in that, and uh, you sell off those investments, you will be subject to capital gains taxes, mm-hmm. right? In qualified investments, you defer those taxes right into the future, you know, with your 401k, your traditional IRA, yeah. whatever have you. So that's what separates a non-qualified account versus a qualified account. Okay, that's good enough. And then, you know, I'm a big believer in real estate. Like, I love real estate. Mm-hmm. I think everybody should partake in owning some type of real estate in some capacity. hmm whether it, you know, you be a homeowner, whether you're an investor, whether you passively invest in real estate, uh, I think everybody deserves or uh, everybody should benefit from having real estate in their portfolio. How do you think having real estate in your portfolio um, differs? Or what, what do you think the importance of the, the, the diversification of having real estate versus you've already taken care of your, your company match with your 401k. Yes. And then other things like either a Roth IRA or like whatever it is that you're doing on your own yeah. versus a real estate investment. What does like the the trajectory look like if you could walk down the future of both those paths? How do those two paths differ? 
Uh, so that makes sense. As far as real estate and versus investments in the stock market, how do they differ? Um, well, whatever your your whatever your IRA is is in, so it might be the stock market. Yeah. I don't know, sometimes they're in pension. You know, they, they can be yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. Typically, those uh, dollars and those qualified accounts will be tied to the market, to the mm-hmm. stock market, right? So, mm-hmm. I always tell my clients, you never want to have all of your eggs in any one basket. Mm-hmm. That's the power of taking advantage of real estate. That's the power of taking advantage of you know other investment opportunities, such as you know investing in the market, right? If you are an accredited investor, you know look into you know, different types of limited partnerships, taking advantage of that, right? Because now you have your eggs spread amongst a number of asset classes in a number of other places. And uh, that way, if the stock market was to tumble, Mm -hmm. right, and we were to be down by 20%, like how we were in 2022, you're not really stressing out about that. Like, you're not really tripping about it because, first off, you're a long-term investor, Mm -hmm. and this isn't your sole investment right mm-hmm. you have money in a number of other places long-term investor mm-hmm. oh, patience. patience patience so patient yeah patience 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 that's kind of what i was looking for word wise is that in either in either vehicle either vehicle essentially is going to get you to the same end destination yeah. um you might have and you know more about the the ross and all that stuff than i do but you might have and correct me if i'm wrong you might have a little bit more flexibility on the real estate end yes or no no, is that incorrect? I mean, to a degree. I don't know um, too much about the so like, investment accounts that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so when you have real estate, mm-hmm. obviously you can take out a home equity line of credit. You can mm-hmm. leverage that. Um, you know, you can sell that property, mm-hmm. whatever have you. Um, it's really all dependent upon the terms that you're offered, right? That's going to essentially account for that flexibility. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, you have an investment account such as a Roth IRA, Yes, you know, you can't access the gains mm-hmm. of that investment over time because you'll be subject to a 10% penalty and you got to pay ordinary income taxes, all yeah, of that all stuff. That stuff yeah. right, same thing applies with a 401k. Uh, but the difference with a Roth IRA, you can actually gain access to everything that you contribute, right? Um, so that's a plus of a Roth IRA. Okay. With a 401k, you can take out a 401k loan, right? Those mm-hmm. things are available to you. But if people are thinking about, you know, leveraging those investments, I always say, hey, we want to leverage these investments to buy more assets. We don't want to go, you know, borrow against our 401k or pull from our Roth IRA to go and buy a, uh, a car mm-hmm. or go fund an expensive vacation trip or What's something. What's the difference like between an investment and an asset in your mind? So the difference between an investment and an asset, I would say essentially they're the same thing. I mean, it's no difference because mm-hmm. both are going to appreciate over time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, both are going to provide a return for you. And, you know, when we talk about investing, the overall goal of an investment is to outpace inflation. Yeah. If you're not doing that, I do, really wouldn't call it an investment. Okay. That's fair. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. Good stuff. All right. Next point. What else we got? We've got... Okay. Where should... And you kind of hit on this earlier. Where should you save for your down payment? Ooh. That's you a, you did kind of hit on this earlier. We talked about it yeah. when we were talking about savings, remember? Yeah. To a degree. Um, so it all depends upon when you're looking to make that home purchase, mm-hmm. right? So if you're looking to make that purchase within the next one to two years, you don't want to put that money in the stock market because who knows what the stock market is going to do, you know, a year or two from now, mm-hmm. right? So we want to have that money tied to some safer investments, you know, or some safer vehicles such as, you know, a money market account. Um, you know, even looking into a high yield savings or right now I say, uh, treasuries are attractive, you know, um, treasury bonds, uh, some T notes, some T bills, you know, with interest rates being so high. I feel like the average person though, like doesn't know why they would invest in a treasury bond or even what it is or a yield. You know, I mean, do they, does the average person know that? Like from your conversation, do they know that? Rarely. And Uh, so that's where it's my job to educate them on all the different tools and Mm -hmm vehicles that's available to them so they know and it's up to you to make the decision right mm-hmm. but at least you know you can make that decision yeah. and you can make it uh informed moving forward mm-hmm. okay all right yeah but you know anything longer than two years then you know you can tie that money to the market mm-hmm. right and allow it to perform for you over time but yeah uh because when we talk about overall investments it's all about your time horizon or when you're going to need access to that money so the sooner you need access to that money, the less risk you can take on. 
but the longer you have, you know, to access that money, the more risk you can take on, like, such as a 401k, right? We're both in our mid-20s, right? We can take on, you know, some pretty aggressive risk, Mm -hmm. you know, in a retirement vehicle, you know, such as a 401k, a Roth IRA, right? Because we have 30 to, you know, almost 40 years. What do you think about cryptocurrency? Uh, If you're a long-term investor, Mm -hmm. take advantage of it. Uh, But again, not having all your eggs in one basket, we want to diversify. So definitely don't want to put, you know, all your eggs into cryptocurrency, right? And I'm not telling nobody to put all their eggs in the stocks or put all their eggs in the real estate. So it's all about being mindful of how much of your net worth you're tying to Mm -hmm. cryptocurrency. But yeah, I I see I'm a believer. In terms of risk, where do you think cryptocurrency falls on that scale of, you know, what you were just talking about? Yeah, so we actually... Uh, matter of fact, matter of fact, go through all of them. What do you think? Cryptocurrency, stocks, real estate, and the uh, retirement accounts. Like, if you were to order them in terms of risk, where would you say they fall? So, definitely cryptocurrency is at the top. Okay. Because, you know, it's Bitcoin. And then if you just look at the overall movement of, you know, those cryptocurrencies, whether it be Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, you know, whether it be the other altcoins, mm-hmm. right? the swings that you see are, you know, so drastic over time. You know, one minute it's up, you know, 20% or so. The next minute it's down 20%. So uh, the swings are so volatile mm-hmm. that not many people are willing to hold on to it for a long period of time. So that's why it falls on the more riskier investment. And I would say it, it's the most riskiest investment you can take uh, advantage of. Right now you think so? Okay. I would say so. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I will place stocks below that. Um you know, and it all depends upon which type of stocks you're invested in because we can get into large cap, we can get into mid cap, we can get into small cap. Mm-hmm. You know, small cap stocks are probably the most volatile uh, that you can take advantage of because large cap would, you know, encompass, you know, your, um, your well-established companies such as Microsoft, the Apples of the, the world, Apple, yeah. Coca-Cola's, Procter & Gamble, mm-hmm. right? You know, shout out Cincinnati. <laughs> but, um, you know, and then, you know, your small cap companies are, you know, your your startups, right? Companies that just IPO maybe, you know, a year or two ago. So those are going to be a lot more volatile mm-hmm. than, uh, you know, Apple, Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble, things of that nature. Okay. Right? And then below stocks, uh, you know, fixed income. You know, that would definitely be, um, you know, uh, a safer investment on the risk spectrum because, you know, you, what do you have mean by fixed income. Bonds. Okay. Right, so bonds is, you know, fixed income. So you're going to put bonds as being more risky than real estate? Uh, You bring up a good point, as a matter of fact. Mm-hmm. I would actually, because I forgot about real estate, I would inverse the two. Mm-hmm. I'll say real estate That's is, say you know, yeah. more riskier than uh, than bonds for sure. Uh, real estate from the standpoint that, because real estate is all about location. You can attest to this, mm-hmm. right? You know, about to you, double back to that. Yeah, if you're in... Um, you know, a solid location, right? Well, actually, I disagree with you. Really? I disagree with you 100%. Right. But before we before we get to that, so riskiest, we said crypto. Yep. Then underneath that, we said stocks. Yep. Then um, we're going to say, are we going to say real estate or are we going to say retirement accounts? But retirement accounts, so it, it's different because I wouldn't necessarily put that into that category mm-hmm. because in retirement accounts, you're investing in stocks or bonds, mm-hmm. right? So I really wouldn't... Uh, I will leave retirement accounts out personally. You'll leave it out because basically that's going to fall under the, yeah, the stocks. riskier stocks mm-hmm. and the safer bonds. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because it's going to fall under both of those. Uh, both of those. Or real estate, honestly, because, I mean, they, they invest in funds. Yeah, they yeah. invest in yeah, all types of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you bring, you bring up a great point. It's, uh, retirement account is a mix of it, mm-hmm. but your returns are not as high as if yep. you were to invest in it directly. Yep. Um, okay, so I think that's a good list. So we, we have crypto, stocks, real estate, and then bonds. Yep. Okay. Bonds are going to give you the lowest yield. Yes. We can agree on that. Yep. Bonds are super, super safe. They're going to give yep. you a very, very low yield, but they're safe. But right now, no, they're looking a lot more attractive just due to the point that, mm-hmm. you know, the Federal Reserve. That's a rabbit yeah, hole. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, they're raising interest rates. Uh, so now those bonds are looking a lot more attractive from a yield standpoint. Mm-hmm. But the overall price of existing bonds are going down. And again, that, that's a whole rabbit hole. Can you explain, if I were to turn on timer, can you explain in – Three minutes, how bonds work. Yeah. Okay, wait. No, I'm going to do it because this is a 45-minute conversation. Hold on. I'm being so serious. All right. Go. All right. So uh, how bonds work, right? Uh, so really, when you talk about any type of bond, 
right? Whoever issues that bond, they're just borrowing money, right? That's really all it is at the end of the day. And how bonds uh, essentially work is they're, they move off of the interest rate environment. So whatever the environment is, uh, whether we're in, in a, a high interest rate environment, a low interest rate environment, those bonds will react accordingly. Mm -hmm. So in an environment like how we're in now with interest rates being so high because inflation is high, mm -hmm. those bonds are looking a lot more attractive to people, right? So those um, those yields will go up over time. But right now, those existing bond prices are going down because you think about bonds that were issued, uh, say, five years ago, mm -hmm. those yields are a lot lower than what new yields are, right? So which is why the price on those existing bonds are going down. Yield is going to be your margin, essentially. Exactly. Your return, yeah. right? So... Um, that's the difference between, you know, existing bonds and, you know, new issue bonds, mm -hmm. right? So the new issue treasury securities, we're looking at around 5%, right? That's pretty attractive. And then you think about the U.S. government, right? Uh, a bond that's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government is probably the safest investment you can take advantage of, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, knowing our country, I mean, I know we're having a number of conversations regarding the debt ceiling and things of that nature, but besides the point, those are seen as the most safest investments um, in the world, mm -hmm. right? So uh, when you take advantage of that, it's essentially risk-free. Yep. So that's how you look at that. You did that in one minute, but you didn't go all the way down the hole. But that's okay. That's okay. That, no, that's good. Don't, don't, yeah. don't, don't. But yeah. For sure. um, so, so bonds, super, super safe. Yep. And then back to the real estate point that we were talking about, um, I think real estate is very, very similar. And we talked about this in podcast one about how real estate – was as proven in 2008 is backed by the government, <laughs> you yes, know? Yes. Um, and I don't think it's all about location. Um, and I also said this in the last podcast because land is the one thing they're not making any more of. Mm -hmm. So population's increasing. The amount of available land is actually literally decreasing. Yes. Um, so that being said, that wherever you are, owning something, I mean, since the beginning of time, people have been trying to expand their kingdoms, take over as much land as they can. Yes. Why? Because land is profitable. Yeah. Not just because people need places to live, but also because land, like it, it, natural resources. I got a they, bottle of water somewhere. They ain't making no more. Right. Well, I mean, rocks. We were just talking earlier. People selling natural resources. These things, everything comes yeah. from land. Yeah. Um, so, so owning that, not only is it safe in the sense of assuming that, you know, there's not some sort of mass catastrophe, natural disaster, um, you're going to be profitable from it. You're going to have cash flow from it. And then it increases in value over time as inflation, which always will, is going to increase. Your land value is also going to increase. Um, so, And then also, depending on what happens with interest rates, more than likely it's going to outpace the rate of inflation. Your appreciation will. Um, so it's one of those situations where it's a true win-win no matter what it is. So I would say in my... For, and one thing that, that Maine touched on a little bit earlier is that I think the most important thing before you sit down and invest in anything is you have to define your personal risk tolerance. Yes. You got to figure out what you're okay with when it comes to how risky you want to be. Me, I'm a, I, I love like flying by the seat of my pants, being as risky as possible, <laughs> right? Um, so <laughs> yeah, but because I mean, I'm, I'm just yeah, like, like yeah. if you, if you don't shoot, you're going to miss, That's a fact. you might as well, you That's know, you, there are snipers out here who they, they line it up and they hit it right on the bullseye. It might take them longer, but they're going to hit it. Yep. And then there's guys who use shotguns, you know, yep. I might miss once or twice, but I'm going to hit something. <laughs> so That's real. the, the, the fact of the matter is what I'm trying to say is that by defining your risk tolerance, what you're doing is you're going to say, Hey, maybe I don't need as much in my, he's going to freak out, in my emergency fund. Maybe what I want to do, maybe I want to use that emergency fund cash to go buy something and then I, like real estate wise, or I want to go invest in something that's going to give me cash flow, whether that be, uh, I don't know, a vending machine or whether that be a real estate uh, mm -hmm. property or whatever, a rental mm -hmm. property, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Invest in something that's going to give me cash flow and then I'm going to use that cash flow that I'm getting monthly to then build up my personal savings fund. Or use that cash flow I'm getting monthly to cover my uh, the credit card that I ran up when I was in college that I shouldn't have, you know. So it all depends on how you decide to to leverage your risk. So and yeah, that's a great point. You know, definitely understanding your risk tolerance that comes first and foremost, right? Just from the standpoint 
that, uh, you know, the more risky you are, right, you know, you know what type of investment to take advantage of, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, that's definitely key. Because that's what scares me. What yeah. scares me about a lot of these conversations is that I feel like, and I know you can, it's funny because like this kind of two opposite ends of the spectrum a little bit, not really, but I feel like a lot of people get scared into thinking that um, they, they want to hold as much money as possible. Man, they hey. they, they want to save as much money as possible, and then they feel like, oh, I have to pay this off, I have to pay that off, I have to pay that off, when the whole economy functions off of debt. Not bad true, debt, good true. debt. Yeah. The richest people in the world, if you, if you were to, I hope that I'm not, this is going to sound crazy, but the richest person in the world, if their child were to get taken or something like that and held hostage for ransom, and someone said, hey, I need $10 billion cash <laughs> right now, they wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, they're going to go into debt for that. You know? Sure. Well, that, I mean, just having that type of cash, a lot of people don't have that type of cash mm-hmm. on hand. Mm-hmm. What they're doing and the great way that they're buying all these big mega mansions <laughs> and stuff like that is they're leveraging their debt and moving their debt away and around, uh, like around so that way the debt pays for itself. Yes. That's why Donald Trump went bankrupt. How many times? Multiple times. <laughs> because he's moving his debt around and then he'll he'll take the b- bankruptcy, you know? Cuz it, it it it's all a it's a it's a game that's played with imaginary money. Yeah. And once you realize that, I think it's much easier to be willing to take on risk and to understand how you can use investments and risk to leverage assets and money and debt yes, and all that yes. stuff. So Yeah, and I would definitely say, um, you know, definitely don't over leverage yourself because yeah, it's a that. difference. You don't want to take on too much debt, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but I definitely think, you know, taking on good debt, you know, that can be fruitful for you in the future. But I would also say liquidity gets you into the game, yes. right? So having access to money. That's gonna get you into the game, right? Because you gonna you still gonna need a down payment, mm-hmm. right? To you know for an investment property, mm-hmm. right? You're gonna need some access to capital. So um, liquidity, having that savings on hand, having different uh, investment accounts that you can gain access to that you can borrow from, yeah. that'll get you into the game for sure. Yeah, yeah. Liquidity. Notice that accounts that you can borrow from. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. that that that's a, a, an investment account that you're taking debt out of to then go use that as liquidity, liquidity to fund an a, a asset yep. or a, something, a good debt investment. Yep. Um, yep. And Just don't borrow from your account and, you know, buy, uh, you know, a Rolex or <laughs> <laughs> a, a chain or something like that. Like, nah, we ain't doing that. We don't ain't talking that. about that. But, yeah. you know, if you're going to take some or money out of vacation, that. on vacation, don't do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to do it, you know, do it responsibly. Mm-hmm. Cool. What else do you want to talk about, though? So, I mean, yeah, tell me tell me more about – take it away. Yeah. I've been talking. I just went on a rampage. Nah, man. I'll say, um, you know, for our audience, uh, you know, from people from the black community, mm-hmm. uh, I think it's extremely important to take advantage of some investments. I think for far too long, uh, you know, we've been behind the eight ball. Why? Uh, I would say previously it's due to a lack of information, mm-hmm. right? But now – we can't use that excuse anymore because we have the tools available to us. We have, you know, Google. We have YouTube University, if you will, right? We have those tools available to us, so we can't really use uh, lack of information as an excuse anymore. Now it's about us truly taking action and taking advantage of the things that are available to us, right? So, um, man, I, I would just say that, you know, don't be scared. Scared money, don't make money. Right, so at some point, you know, you got to jump off the porch. You got to take on some risk. So um, that goes I, back to the team conversation. And I, yeah. I brought this up what four times today. Yeah, because yeah. I think that's so important. Like, yeah, scared money doesn't make money, but don't think you have to do it all on your own. Yeah, that's what he's here for. That's what I'm here exactly. for. And we make money when people that we work with make money. Yeah, right. Like that. That's how. That's how we get paid. We get paid based on y'all making money. Right. And so, um, don't 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 take the the realtor that's saying hey like you should invest in this or or the the financial advisor that's saying hey like you should get a you know a 401k don't take that as them trying to sell you on something mm-hmm. i hate the word sale like, really for from my standpoint from uh-huh. my point of view cuz i would say at the end of the day right when it comes to having that team around you mm-hmm. it's all about relationships mm-hmm. it's all about building quality relationships mm-hmm. that are long lasting 
Mm-hmm. Right? So when you do that, really it's just educating. Right? I feel it's, like so many people get that confused though. Yeah. I feel like so many people when they are fresh out of college and they get that call from that financial advisor that happens your first six months out of college every single time. Yep. They're like, no, no, I'm not good because they feel like they're trying to be sold on something. Yeah. You know? And yeah. That's and just not the case. Really, you know, because first off, this is how I approach it. Like, I call somebody up, like, you know, say they answer, say they are reluctant to having a conversation. I don't know if I can help you at all. Like, I have no clue because I don't know your situation. But that's my goal to have a conversation so I can better understand your situation. So I can better, you know, understand if I can help you or not. Mm-hmm. Right. So I don't know if I can be a, a value to you or whatever. But, you know, I think, you know, uh, just touching on our process a little bit, how we do things differently. Right. That initial conversation that we have with our prospective clients, I'm not selling you on nothing. Like, I just want to sit back, learn more about you, learn more about what's important to you. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, ultimately see if we can build a relationship moving forward. Mm-hmm. Right. Because it's twofold. Right. It's a two way street. You know, not only do you want to figure out if I'll be, you know, a, a solid advisor uh, to be in your corner. But I also want to figure out if you will be uh, a solid client mm-hmm. that I'm willing to take on. Right, so that relationship is twofold uh, from that aspect, but uh, that's something I had to learn. Yeah, like I was willing to work like just <laughs> with anybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and and people drive you up a wall. No, for yeah. real, like, people... <laughs> man. Hey, I, I trust me. I, I know, I know, but I think that's why you know it's definitely important uh, from the standpoint that um, you know you look at it, and not only are they interviewing you if they want you to be their realtor, mm-hmm. but also you interviewing them to figure out. Do I want to work with you? Mm-hmm. Right? Are you going to be hard to deal with? You know, are you going to call me up, you know, 24/7? Right? Granted, you there, you know, you have a service-based mentality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You always willing to help, but at the same time, you don't want are people you, are that you coachable. Up. Yeah. And that goes back to sports, are you right? Coachable. Exactly. Like yeah. we, we both sports guys like, you know, you have to be coachable. You have to be willing to be open-minded about things. And if you're not, I mean, it's, you know, I really can't help you too much. Cool. And we and we good. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I'll say, you know, a team, you know, uh, being able to surround yourself with a, a, a solid team of people who truly in your corner, who truly got your best interests at heart, I think that's extremely key. Um, and then beyond that, man, just just putting it in action. Like, far too often, and I don't How know you what do it, that? Man, uh, it, it's just doing it. Like, it's really just taking the information that your team gave you and acting upon it. But how do you get, like... How do you get past that, mm, that mm, like, you know what I'm saying? Like that thing inside of you, like that fear, like, like what, are you, what are some things that you've done in your life walking out the tunnel before a game when you feel that, that little jitter, that little pregame jitter to actually go execute, not in like a mediocre, mediocre, just do what you're supposed to do way, but be like an excellent performer. How do you get over that fear of like thinking about doing, but then achieving mm-hmm. and doing, you know? I would say the plan, like, that trumps everything, right? Because, you know, for football people, right, we practice six days a week. We talking like we still play football. For sure. We- <laughs> everything everything goes back to football, bro. Like, uh-huh. it's, it's, it's real. Uh-huh. So, like, we prepare six days a week for one day a week, right? I think that's extremely important because, you know, you have to prepare. You have to plan, right? And then, you know, if you're – if you prepare – you have all the confidence in the world, right? Because mm-hmm. I know, you know, our coaches, they put us in position, like, and I'm, I'm pretty confident in the game plan. Now it's like, man, I'm, I'm ready to go out here and, you know, do something. Mm-hmm. Same thing applies to investing, man. Like, do your due diligence, you know, um, take in some information. Then it comes a point in time where and you, you just got to say, F it and just go after it and, and just do it. But believe in the work you put in. Exactly. Like, believe in the, the things that you've studied. Believe in the knowledge that you've acquired. Mm-hmm. And just run the play. Like, uh, and that's the thing, too. I like that. Just run the play. Just run the play because, you know, we young, right? Um, so we we, we going to mess up. Like, any investor that said, hey, man, I've been in the game for, you know, 30, 40 years from now, haven't had no mistakes. Lying. <laughs> cap like bro they they are lying. lying right so it's like man like you gonna mess up mm-hmm. you know the greatest investors of the world messed up mm-hmm. the greatest people in the world have messed up right so you know success comes with failure right you have to fail in order to be successful 
So I think a lot of people you should are rush sc- towards failure. Yeah, a lot of people are scared to fail, right? When actually it should be, you know, the opposite end. It should be to your point, running towards that failure. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Well, on that, I appreciate you, my brother. Thank you for joining. Always. Um, you want to give one more shout out to anybody or anything? You're good to go. Nah, man. I would say you know, shout out to the people who are hungry, who are willing to truly build wealth. Right. I hate using the word retirement, but I would say the people who are on pace and who are trying to truly achieve financial freedom. Right. That's you know that's become a common you know, buzzword, if you will, within the past couple of years. Uh, I would say shout out to those people who are on that chase Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, have a solid team in your corner. You know, Cam and I are both here to be a resource. So, um, you know, at any point, you feel free to give me a call. Um, You can reach me anytime and uh, I'm always willing to help. Yep. If you're you're watching this, you probably have my contact information. Reach out to me. I can connect you with him. Um, I also, if you're getting my email blast, his info will be an email blast that goes out with this email. So feel free to reach out to him. But also, once again, thank you guys. Um, Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for the support. Um, Resource. He said we're here as a resource. That's huge. Whatever you need, let me know. Let him know. Whether it's life, whether it's investment, whatever it is. As he mentioned earlier, it's about building relationships because we all thrive when each other are thriving. So when we can help each other, we'll all be better together. So I appreciate you guys. Thanks for tuning in. We out.